So today we're gonna to talk about a disease known as irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. IBS is thought to affect upwards of 10 to 20% of American adults. And it can be characterized by a variety of symptoms which include gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, blood and or mucus in the stool and abdominal distension to name a few. Um, there are three subtypes of IBS that are characterized clinically. These include IBS-C, which is IBS with a constipation dominance, IBS-D, which is IBS with a diarrhea dominance, and IBS-M, which uh, involves individuals having a mix of both constipation and diarrhea. IBS is known to affect women more than men, and it's also known to affect individuals with pre-existing gastric um, diseases or disorders preferentially, so people with things like acid reflux disease um, or constipation. Um, or ulcerative colitis. There are thought to be multifactorial reasons why IBS develops, and these include dietary triggers, um, dysbiosis or changes, unfavorable changes to the microbiome, stress, and infection. And today we're going to focus on the microbiome impact and the dietary triggers. There are multiple suggested mechanisms as to why food and diet can contribute to the onset and progression of IBS. For example, fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols, also known as FODMAPs, are known to trigger IBS symptoms in some individuals. And this is likely due to the presence of inflammation in the gut upon consumption of these FODMAPs. So when the gut is inflamed, um, and the microbiome breaks down these FODMAPs into molecules like short-chain fatty acids, the gut is un incapable of effectively taking up these short-chain fatty acids. So they can cause gas and bloating um, in the intestines and can also change gut motility, which can either create diarrhea or constipation. Dairy products are also attributed to IBS symptom onset and progression in some individuals. Individuals who lack the enzyme lactase, which breaks down lactose into galactose and glucose in the intestines, will basically have this lactose spill over into the colon, where it can create osmotic shifts that can lead to diarrhea and bloating. Additionally, fructose can be a trigger for certain people with IBS. Fructose and glucose are transported through the small intestine into the bloodstream in a one-to-one -one ratio. So if fructose consumption outpaces glucose consumption, as in the consumption of um, maybe sweetened beverages with high fructose corn syrup like soda. Um, essentially, this can cause glucose to spill over into the colon, where it can create intense bloating for some individuals. Similarly, the consumption of sugar alcohols can also serve as a trigger for certain individuals, as these sugar alcohols aren't really metabolized by the human body, and so they can travel to the microbiome where they're readily metabolized and gases are made. Individuals with subclinical food allergies may experience the onset of IBS symptoms from very specific foods. Subclinical food allergies are essentially food allergies that do not trigger an anaphylactic response or a systemic um, strong immune response, but what they do, however, do is create a low-grade inflammatory response that can be persistent. And this inflammation can essentially drive up um, issues in the gut because the gut loses the ability to effectively burn the short-chain fatty acids produced by the microbiome and these can build up as gas and cause changes in gut motility like we mentioned before. Um, so to identify subclinical food allergies, it's imperative for somebody to, if they suspect having this issue, do an elimination diet. And in an elimination diet, you essentially want to eliminate uh, potential trigger foods. A lot of the common ones uh, for most people would be wheat, eggs, dairy, um, and potentially soy. And essentially you want to remove all the potential trigger foods at once and keep them out of the diet for at least two weeks. During this time, you want to track any sort of symptoms and experiences you're feeling in your body during that time. Um, and then you want to virtually uh, reintroduce each food one at a time and journal basically how you're feeling um, upon each reintroduction. You don't want to introduce foods too quickly in succession, you would want to do maybe one food per week. And in this way, you can identify a potential trigger food and then remove it entirely from the diet and focus on spinning down inflammation in the gut, healing the gut, and then over time, you can start to slowly microdose this food back into the diet to try to build a tolerance to it and see 
um, if you can avoid triggering a response and you'll now be able to eat this food freely. Interestingly, in clinical studies, wheat consumption has been shown to be a major dietary trigger of IBS in certain patients. Um, in this study, they showed that wheat actually triggered an inflammatory response in the gut, increased gut permeability, and changed gut motility. And interestingly, they showed that specific species of Pseudomonas and Lactobacillus in the microbiome are able to actually degrade the molecules in wheat, such as gluten and other proteins that uh, are associated with the flares in IBS. So there's actually a potential here for targeted microbiome manipulation, manipulation to introduce these strains into the gut to help facilitate the breakdown of these proteins and avoid the harmful effects. In regards to the connection between the microbiome and IBS, a 2019 meta-analysis showed a very large and, and significant connection between um, the population of bifidobacteria in the gut and IBS onset. We know that bifidobacteria is absolutely critical for not only immune regulation, but also gut health and motility and the maintenance of an overall healthy and diverse microbiome. Additionally, an enhanced presence of bacteroides and E. coli in the gut were also shown to be positively associated with IBS in patients. Um, although bacteroides is generally seen as a, a group of beneficial bacteria, it can also be induced to create harmful molecules um, in certain contexts. And these molecules can actually harm human cells of the gut and create an inflammatory response that then um, like we mentioned before, can reduce short-chain fatty acid uptake, which can lead to enhanced glucose burning by the colon, which actually drives up oxygen levels um, in the colon cells and prevents beneficial bacteria that prefer low oxygen environments from thriving. Um, in addition, E. coli is associated um, in high abundance with weight gain, um, gut inflammation, and overall poor gut health relative to people with lower levels of E. coli. Although a low FODMAP diet is generally associated with acute cessation of symptoms in IBS patients, this actually isn't a good long-term strategy. And that's because by removing FODMAP from the diet, you actually will reproducibly decrease the levels of bifidobacteria present in the gut. And that's because bifidobacteria love to consume and metabolize these FODMAP uh, containing foods to create the uh, organic acid and short-chain fatty acid lactate and acetate. And this lactate and acetate goes on to feed other beneficial strains of bacteria in the gut in something called a cross-feeding interaction. So by removing FODMAPs in the long term, you're actually going to damage, um, create more damaging effects to the gut by decreasing bifido populations, which will compromise overall health of the microbiome. Additionally, clinical research suggests that IBS patients have increased gut permeability rel relative to healthy controls. To this end, we can target the microbiome to help improve gut permeability and therefore begin to decrease inflammation in the gut and enhance overall gut health and microbiome health. To do this, we can target the bacteria known as Acromantia mucinophila. Acromantia lives in the mucus layer of the gut where it feasts on the mucus protein. And here it will actually help to enhance the thickness of the mucus layer by stimulating the cells that make mucus to make more. By increasing the thickness of the mucus layer, it actually will decrease gut permeability and help to maintain the gut lining more effectively. So we can target acromantia by feeding with something like apple peel powder, which contains specific molecules that feed acromantia and in doing so will support uh, decreases in gut permeability. We can also support bifidobacteria levels by feeding compounds such as human milk oligosaccharides like 2-fucosalactose, as well as red polyphenols that can be found in things like cranberry, raspberry, strawberry, um, etc. So through targeting acromantia and bifidobacteria populations, we can help to reestablish a healthy homeostasis in the gut decrease inflammation, decrease permeability, and start to restore a healthy ecosystem within the colon. So although the causes of IBS are still somewhat unknown, there is clear relationship between dietary triggers and changes in the microbiome and the development and, and progression of IBS. So to this end, we can have a multifactorial approach to treating IBS. 
first, if there are suspected food triggers, an elimination diet should be performed. And then food should be slowly reintroduced after a two week period to assess whether symptom onset recurs. If so, those foods should be eliminated for a moderate period of time and a focus should be placed on decreasing inflammation in the gut and restoring gut barrier integrity. Um, we can do this through uh, bolstering populations of bifidobacteria and acromantia through the methods previously described. Regarding spinning down gut inflammation, there are a few strategies that we can implement to help make this a reality. So the first is by supplementing with either a pulp-free orange juice or directly with uh, a supplement called hesperidin. So hesperidin is found in oranges and it has a really potent effect on ameliorating inflammation in the gut. So the consumption of this um, on an empty stomach essentially would help to eliminate inflammation in the gut prior to introducing things like um, human milk oligosaccharides like 2 lactose um, as if the gut is inflamed and you consume HMOs, there is a chance that bloating could occur as these short chain fatty acids build up and aren't taken up effectively by the gut. So we can use hesperidin. We can also use N-acetylcysteine, which is the precursor to glutathione in the body. Glutathione is the primary endogenously produced antioxidant molecule. Thirdly, we can use omega-3 fatty acids like EPA and DHA. These are uh, found abundantly in marine uh, fish, like fatty fish, like sardines, salmon, um, some shellfish. These omega-3s help to uh, spin down inflammation at the whole body level, including at the gut level, um, through various mechanisms, uh, including the production of factors that will modulate immune cells to help produce more anti-inflammatory factors. So overall, using these strategies, we can really start to bring the inflammation levels down, and then ultimately implement strategies including the polyphenols, the human milk oligosaccharides, and the apple peel powder to then help bolster acromantia and bifidobacteria levels and begin to bring a healing uh, environment for the gut microbiome and for the colon to reestablish homeostasis and, and long-term health.